Good evening. This meeting is now convened. The time is 5.31 p.m. Board Secretary, please let the record show that all board members are present with the exception of Dr. Frederick. Thank you. <coughs> Chief Communication Officer, Mr. Hall, will introduce students from McBride Elementary to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, and good evening, board members. We do have four students from McBride. Joining us tonight is Evie Champ. Evie, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you were ready. <laughs> Evie Champ, thank you. Gage Henderson, Addie Lord, and Lucy Weaver. Would you come over, please? Here. This is the dream team tonight, everybody. These students have been nominated by their teachers as role models for positive behavior at McBride. Their principal, Ms. Lael Strait, said that they are involved in sports, student council, and other school activities and give their best efforts every day on their schoolwork. Gage helped his parents run a fruit stand all summer, and he takes pride in his daily work. Addie is a fierce soccer player and great team leader, Lucy recently helped her mom run a booth at McBride's SPS University event. And Evie uses her sense of humor to make everyone smile and laugh when they need it most. And I've seen that already tonight. <laughs> if you're a family member of one of these awesome students, would you please stand so we can recognize you? Now we invite all those who are able to please stand and join in the pledge while these students lead the pledge. Whenever you're ready. We have a full honoring excellence this evening and we're pleased our first recognition tonight is of a Central High School junior who has been honored by the College Board National Recognition Program for his academic excellence. Samuel Cummings, please come forward. National Award for Samuel recognizes academic achievement in school and outstanding performance on the PSAT and or the AP exams, which are grueling tests that require a mastery of upper level courses prior to a student's senior year. Only the top 10% of all test takers are eligible to apply. In addition, Samuel received the National African American Recognition Award. With the start of his junior year underway, Samuel is focused on his goal, four years at Washington University in St. Louis, followed by medical school. Congratulations to Samuel. We also want to recognize uh, Samuel's parents, Samantha and Oren Cummings, if you would please stand as well. Across the United States, only 38 high schools have earned the top honor for athletic programming bestowed by the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. So just want to make sure I underscore that only 38 high schools nationwide. There will soon be five more, and all of those are from Springfield Public Schools. Just 
Central, Glendale, Hillcrest, Kickapoo, and Parkview High Schools will officially earn the Quality Program Award at the exemplary level through NIAAA later this year. Only three other Missouri schools have achieved this highest award. This accreditation program requires rigorous review and data collection to ensure only best practices are being utilized within a school's athletic department. The review process took a year to complete and would not have been possible without the dedication of the SPS athletics team, including the athletic directors at each of our high schools. Please join us in recognizing Josh Scott, Jason Michael, Cole Dishman, Jackie Hill, Isaac Isaiah, Scott Phillips, and Steve Spence. Would you please come forward? Just really proud of this group. Uh, we've been uh, working together for the last five years, and part of this accreditation process is to look at what we have available and how we work and what our practices and policies are. Uh, it's not only identifying what's working well, but it's identifying opportunities to improve. And uh, over the course of the last year, we did that with uh, creating student and parent handbooks for athletics, coaches' handbooks <coughs> for athletics, and really standardizing. Uh, how we all operate together while having our differences and our independence at each school. So really proud of this group right here. It was a tremendous effort and uh, excited for Nashville in December to get the award. National Hispanic Heritage Month is celebrated <clears throat> September 15th through October 15th to recognize the histories, cultures, and contributions of Hispanic people. Many of our schools are organizing events and activities to highlight Hispanic heritage, and one of those is Pipkin Middle School. School community liaison Richard Salgado co-sponsors the Latinx Connections, which is a before-school club for any student who wants to participate. Mr. Salgado, would you please come forward and share with us some of the activities that Pipkin students are participating in this month? Sure, welcome. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be able to represent our Latinx community here at, in Springfield. And so one of the things that we do is, as, as was said, the Latinx Connections Group. And this group is a group for all our Latinx students. We create a culture of family in our school. And so what we do is we have breakfast together, we talk with one another, we encourage one another. The biggest thing is to equip our students with the resources necessary to be successful in the next step of life. So if we have eighth graders going into high school, we get them prepared for high school. If we have sixth graders going into seventh grade, we prepare them for that next level. But what we want is to create a community where they can fall back to and understand that there is some level of accountability as well. And so it's an honor to be able to lead this group at Pipkin, and I hope we can do that district-wide as well. So I appreciate you guys. We have um, a legacy of educational excellence in the Salgado family. If you remember last month, we recognized Mr. Fabio Salgado um, for his support at one of our schools, and that is Mr. Salgado's brother. So. Oh. We now move forward with service anniversaries. Tonight, we begin a special recognition for staff members who celebrate 25, 30, and 35 year service anniversaries during this school year. This year, we have more than 30 employees will be achieving these significant milestones. Between now and November, we will be inviting these special employees to join us so that we may recognize their dedication to SPS and to our students. With us this evening is one employee who is commemorating 35 years of service with Springfield Public Schools. Dr. Sheila Wynn, would you please come forward? Dr. Wynn is the Executive Director of Secondary Learning. She began her career with SPS in 1987 as an elementary school physical education teacher. In 2001, she became an assistant principal at Parkview High School, where she served for 15 years 
before moving into a district leadership position. Please join us in thanking Dr. Wynn for her dedicated service to SPS. I don't have anything planned. And if you know me very well, you know I'm not a great off-the-cuff speaker. I, like, I always like to have a few notes. Um, actually, I have a couple more years because I haven't just been in Springfield. So I think it's, I'm just tickled that I'm still waking up every morning, right? Beats the alternative. Um, I've had a great experience in SPS. I've had a lot of opportunity, and I've had some terrific mentors. Um, several of those people are sitting in the room right now. So that's the reason. Um, for any of my success as far as just being able to be in the classroom and work with kids and work with teachers. So I've had a great experience and I hope I uh, continue to have a job. That's what I say every <laughs> day. <laughs> so thank you very much. The award is not needed. I appreciate uh, working and being a servant. So Awesome. privilege to speak on behalf of all of Dr. Wynn's colleagues. It is an honor to work with her every day, and we learn from her every day. Next, we are going to preview the Hall of Fame inductees for this year's Hall of Fame class. I'll let the slide here. So typically our recognitions um, at board meetings are for current students, but tonight we would like to highlight former SPS students. On October 20th, we will induct two SPS alumni into the Springfield Public Schools Hall of Fame. This is the 13th year for this event, and we look forward to celebrating these two outstanding graduates. John Holstein is a 1963 graduate of Parkview High School. He has the distinction of being the only judge in Missouri history to have served at every level of the Missouri State Judiciary. In 1989, he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Missouri, where he served as Chief Justice. He retired in 2002 and returned to private practice. Currently, John is engaged full-time as an arbitrator, mediator, and in other forms of alternative dispute resolution. John has served on the board of the Springfield Metropolitan Bar Association, Rotary, United Way of the Ozarks, and on the fundraising committee at Legal Services of Southwest Missouri. John served 27 years in the United States Army, both active and reserve. He retired in 1997, holding the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Anthony Tolliver is a 2003 graduate of Kickapoo High School. His successful career as an NBA basketball player for more than 13 years has attracted national attention, but his fans may be less familiar with his achievements off the court. As an entrepreneur and philanthropist, Anthony has made an impact not only in Springfield, but around the world. His businesses have created jobs and he has encouraged others to strive for financial independence. His global humanitarian efforts have raised money to provide water wells and mosquito nets for children in Africa. In 2020, Anthony had the opportunity to meet with Pope Francis along with other NBA players to share about this humanitarian work. Earlier this year, he established the Tolliver Family Foundation to fund an endowed college scholarship in memory of his mother, Donna Lewis, who is a longtime educator at SPS. Our Hall of Fame event is made possible by generous donations from the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools, 417 Magazine, Maddox New Prater Eye Center, KY3, Ad Smith, and other sponsors. So we'll look forward to celebrating these outstanding um, individuals in October. My name is... And last but not least, we are excited to share another one of our many personal stories that make SPS a place where everyone's story is valued. 
This month's Your Story is Our Story video celebrates an employee who is making a difference at Williams Elementary School. Let's watch and learn more about Mrs. Debbie Anderson. My name is Debbie Anderson and I am a Williams fourth grade teacher. Last year, I took a new position as the numeracy interventions at Williams. While I was here, I saw where Ms. Dessa had this clear vision of what Williams could be. When I discovered some things were changing in the building, I took it as an opportunity to help these children grow. And so I switched from the numeracy interventionist to the fourth grade teacher to see these kids move to their potential and be prepared for fifth grade. So a story she shared with me last school year was, she said, Mrs. Dessa, I know that our school can be the best school in all of Springfield. We can be a blue ribbon school. And just her commitment and her sense of direction with that was inspiring to me as her principal. But knowing that if she has that kind of self-efficacy in herself, what impact could she make with our students? And the belief she has in them is inspiring to me. When I walk into her classroom, her students are scholars and she's preparing them for a bright future because she believes in them. As a student at SBS, the memory of the first day when a friend gave my sweater to me at recess just because I didn't remember where it was hung up ended up being one of my bridesmaids. And here I am, a fourth grade teacher, teaching kids that move in, that are new. And that's what gets me up every day. I just want to say uh, thank you the students. My class thinks that they're getting the award today. <laughs> they are. They are. They got to be in the video. I, I'm so <laughs> proud of them. And so we are making a difference at Williams. And I want to give a special shout out to Dr. Hopper because if she hadn't given me the ethics and the, the fortitude, and then once again, my mother and my husband who are here if they wouldn't support me in order to dedicate the amount of hours it takes to do this. Thank you. Thank you. And we invite you to continue following along as we share more SPS stories on social media and here again next month. Thank you and that concludes Honoring Excellence. Thank you, Stephen. Our next agenda item is the approval of the agenda. The recommended action is that the board approve the agenda as pre presented. Do I have a motion? Moved. Second. No second. Should we in Scott? In Scott. Okay, yeah. Are there any comments or questions? Are any of my colleagues? Okay, there we go. I'm sorry about my voice. It's the tail end of a chest cold. Okay, motion passes. <clears throat> Next, we have public comments. Do you mind reading that? Sure. Thank you. We have now come to the portion of our meeting where we hear from speakers. The Board of Education welcomes comments about the issues being discussed. The board uses this time in, our me in their meeting uh, to listen to the public, but will not comment or engage with the public during this meeting. The board allows up to 10 speakers for public comment period. 
The board chair will call on individuals in the order in which they signed up. Substitutions are not permitted. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes and will be timed by the board secretary. Comments must be acceptable for a business and family-friendly environment. Inappropriate language, gestures, or personal tags will not be tolerated. It is inappropriate to address the board about individual students or individual staff members by name in open meeting. If you have concerns about individuals, these concerns should be addressed to the appropriate administrative supervisors, either in the schools or in the district <coughs> office. If you have materials that you want to share, please place them in the tray on the podium and they will be distributed to the board following the meeting. The first speaker is Justin Michael Hasty. Good evening, board. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, my name is Michael Hasty. Justin's the legal first name. Uh, father of four, uh, they're with me tonight. Three are currently enrolled in SPS, and one will be joining her siblings next year, so all four of my kids will be in the SPS school systems. Uh, I'm here tonight because I feel as a parent the meetings have been hijacked to kind of divert the board from what your focus should be, and that's academic achievement amongst the SPS students and there's many parents like me that don't have the time to come here so I'm gonna talk about some stuff that you guys should already know I've looked into the district statistics and it's kind of alarming being the largest school district in the state of Missouri and we rank in the bottom 50th percentile we have a 34 percent mathematical comprehension amongst our students and about a 50 percent for reading the reading comprehension is really hits close to home because all three of my kids who have never been educated in any other public school system have never read at grade level. That's a problem for me because I'm not a teacher and I really want my kids to have the best in life. Academics should be the focus of the school. I do support the move from the, what I perceive in kindergarten and first grade as a technological crutch that was put on the kids because technology should be a, it should be a tool, it should be an asset, it shouldn't be a crutch and a, a substitute for anything. And I'm going to continue to stress academics because as the largest school district in the state of Missouri, we should be setting the bar. We spend over, I think, over $5,000 more than Ozark, Nixon, and Republic do per student per year. We spend more per student per year than any other school district in the state of Missouri, over 550 schools, and yet we're at the bottom of the list. Rockwood, the second largest school district, is in the top 100. These other schools around us are in the top 100 schools, and I think we should be doing better. So... I just feel that the board's moved to an academic focus because whatever we've been doing has not been working and the academic achievement of students should be the chief and only concern in my opinion as a parent of what SPS looks for. So I just wanted to come here tonight and say I look forward to seeing where the shift uh, in academic focus kind of takes us and see if it'll help my kids because even this year my boys aren't doing math at math level. And that's very disheartening considering this is the only school system that they've ever been educated in. So I feel that that is a good shift. And there's a lot of stuff that gets thrown up here. People bring up studies and feelings and I'm bringing up statistics and data because I'm a numbers guy. I believe that numbers don't lie. I believe people do. I believe quantitative information is undeniable. Whether you agree with it or not, the data speaks for itself. And we have been failing our children across the board, whether you're black, you're white, Christian or you're not. It doesn't matter where you fall anywhere across the board in SPS. So I, I really look forward to seeing where the board moves to that academic achievement for the students. And as a parent, like I said, that's, I, I'm a stakeholder here. So as a parent, that's my chief concern. And I really look forward to seeing where that moves this year. So thanks for your time. I appreciate all you guys are doing. Next speaker is Kyler Sherman Wilkins. Tyler Sherman Wilkins. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the next speaker. Dan Boone. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call these comments what could be. As you are all fully aware by this time, I am very concerned about the proficiency of our students at grade level. Generally speaking, roughly two-thirds of our students fail to meet minimum standards in math and English. So I want to demonstrate what could be with a real-life example. No opinions, just facts. 
When the virus really hit hard a couple of years ago, my son elected to have his first grader homeschooled by me as it was probably only going to take a couple of months to get through that. As we all know, the virus took around a year to get over. As we began homeschooling, I soon began to realize we were qu quickly running out of first grade material. He was absorbing it at a very fast rate. For the sake of clarity, let's just talk about math for the moment. After three months, we finished first grade math. Three months later, we finished second grade math. By the end of the year, we finished third grade math. Not being a teacher, I wanted to make sure that I was covering the correct material and he was truly understanding it. So I created comprehensive finals at each grade level. He did all these tests on his own with no coaching. For first grade, I created a 50 question final. He scored 50 out of 50. For second grade, I created a 100 question final. He scored 97 out of 100. For third grade, I created a 150 question final. He scored 150 out of 150. And I'll remind you, this is a first grader. For a point of reference, one of the test questions was 4,832 plus 2,382. This problem includes two points to carry over to solve. Here is the actual 150 question final that I gave him. So let's just hold that in our, our thoughts for just a second. As you recall, back in February, school was canceled for a week due to too many teachers being out sick. School sent home a work pa uh, packet that week. I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to see exactly where he was in second grade. Here is a copy of the math sheet that was actually sent home for him to work on. 6 plus 6 equals 12. 9 plus 9 equals 18. I said, that's it? Are you kidding me? We were all doing more difficult problems in the first month of homeschooling in first grade than what we were teaching him in second grade. There's no comparison in the difficulty of those two problems. Are you still wondering as to why kids going through your education program are failing to meet minimum standards? He has actually regressed because we're not challenging him. So what's the point here? The point is, is that he was and is able to absorb educational material at a much faster rate than what you're making it available to him. If he can do it, I know there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of other kids at SPS that can do the same. I know someone's gonna say, not all kids are like that. I know that, I have another grandson that has an IEP, and that's a totally different conversation. So raise your standards, the kids are up to the challenge. So that's what could be versus what it is right now. So the decision is yours, thank you. The next speaker is Laura Mullins. Good evening. I'm Laura Mullins, president of SNEA, and I'm here this evening to talk about a very concerning barrier to student achievement. School districts are essentially a team of people with a common purpose and goals. Like any team, each position has specific roles and responsibilities. Teachers are a large part of this team and are widely considered the experts in the classroom with a comprehensive and authoritative knowledge of teaching methods and learning pedagogies. Research tells us that teams cannot reach the highest levels of effectiveness without high levels of trust. Currently, this is where there is a barrier at SPS. <clears throat> we are all well aware of the academic deficiencies of our students. This is a burden we should all be bearing. However, it appears that teachers are again shouldering the brunt of their responsibility. Instead of trusting teachers to use the skills and knowledge they have attained through their education, experience, and expertise to write effective lesson plans, teachers are now being told to use a specific format that requires pages of documentation and endless additional hours of preparation. This expectation is excessive and, more importantly, not the key to student success. This requirement of writing seven-step lesson plans for each subject for every day takes away from other vital responsibilities of a teacher, such as preparing materials, providing valuable feedback to students, communicating with parents, and collaborating with teammates. As this format is a common requirement for pre-service teachers, it is also a complete show of disrespect for them as experienced professionals, leaving many feeling that they are being treated as incapable by having to prove they know how to write effective lessons. I may also note a well-scripted lesson plan does not equate to well-delivered instruction. Additionally, the added expectation that these lessons be submitted in advance and should, quote, match what is occurring in the classroom at any given time is not compatible with responsive teaching in which lessons are adapted to meet student needs. Learning is fluid, 
and so should be our ability to adjust lesson plans. No one knows what our students need better than their teacher. In the end, the students will suffer the negative effects of this expectation. Our administrators are constantly referred to as leaders. This isn't leadership. This is a culture of management. True leadership is the ability to inspire, motivate, and enable others to contribute toward a group's success, not controlling and monitoring a group to accomplish a goal. Unfortunately, the micromanagement does not stop there. This year, for Parent-Teacher Conference Week, instead of allowing the flexibility for teachers to work with parents and their own family obligations to set up conference times, many sites are being assigned times by administration that, must be that they must be present to ensure our, quote, hours are met. This is not trust. This is not teamwork. This lack of autonomy is leaving staff feeling overworked and undervalued and will ultimately be another nail in the coffin of retaining teachers at SPS. I ask that you encourage respect for teachers as capable, trusted members of our SPS team by treating them as the professionals they are and returning the decision-making ability back to the classroom experts. Thank you. Next is Stephanie Sproul. Sorry, Stephanie Sproul. I just wanted to come here to give y'all a little bit of thanks and praise. Um, bless y'all for expanding the bus services. Um, we desperately needed it, and it's made the school change times much more attainable. And it, thank you. Um, the transportation department is doing a much better job of communicating with parents. I know principals at Sherwood are in there cleaning up the the cafeteria every day and showing exactly what leadership looks like and they get down and they do the lowest level of jobs technically but they really get to know the kids in the meantime and show support for their staff. Um, thank you for removing Chromebooks as such a staple into education and thank you Dr. Lathan because you've done a much better job than any superintendent I've seen in the past at going above and beyond to follow up, and it may not be on the timeline we like, and it may not be in the exact manner that we like, but you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, thank you for thinking to include parents as you revamp your strategic plan. I am genuinely excited to see what this team will put together in the com coming months. Thank you board members who have nothing but good intentions when you chose to run for your seat. You put yourself, your spouses, and your children, and your careers on the line to stand up for education and finding ways to serve our school system and community. At the last board meeting, y'all took quite a verbal attack for many people, and I want to thank you for continuing to remain steadfast in your hard work and focused to better the education process for our children. One man actually stood up and was name-calling. For some reason, that guy wasn't gaveled or removed. This man also chooses to fraternize with minors in his spare time and organize school protests on campuses, even though he doesn't have children in his own in attendance. This image... <laughs> is an image of a glow center event and is exactly why our schools need to focus on education. This movement is not in the best interest of protecting our children and belongs nowhere near our public education system. SPS is the largest in the state, yet here we are in the bottom 50% in ranking, graduation rate, and math proficiency. If this image is alar alarming to you, then God bless you for being where you are because this is the battle we're up against. Many other people have talked about, you know, education and how we need to, that needs to be our focus. And if that is your focus, please remain where you are because you have thousands of parents who support you in doing so. And these keyboard warrior attacks and the people that organize little groups to come attack you, it's not going to be tolerated anymore. You were the Board of Education and we appreciate you for shifting focus and doing exactly what parents want you to do and why our kids are in public school. So... Thank you very much for the changes we've seen. Next speaker is Natalie Siever. Nat <clears throat> Natalie Siever. Jonathan Spruill. Jonathan Spruill. Moving on to Cat. Trustler. Hello again. Um, it's been three weeks since I last stood in front of you, and there are still no pride flags at Kickapoo. 
So today I come to you asking the school board to send a communication clarifying the district rule used to justify their removal to allow teachers to put their flags back. I also ask that you fully support the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, that you reinstate diversity training for staff, that you empower your equity champions at each school to evaluate their population's needs and provide education to staff as they see fit, to reinstate the Citizen Advisory Council. And most importantly, that we allow the DEI office to create age-appropriate curriculum for students in all grades. Please remember that education is not just about academics. Comments made by some members of our board prove that you can be academically educated and still be socially ignorant. Public education is about creating good citizens who are able to participate in society. <clears throat> I do not want to hear that this is a funding issue. When going through the agenda, I see that Kickapoo High School alone has over $140,000 just for extracurriculars um, in their asks. These lessons have to start early. Diversity training helps children be more creative, um, more open-minded, to develop empathy, and it reduces bullying in our schools. Without ensuring cultural competency, we'll be releasing students into college environments and diverse work environments unable to compete with their peers. I work for a very large company, and I've been honored to serve on our local DEI council. I facilitated training in microaggressions, microinequities, bias, gender identity, neurodiversity, and yes, race. Companies like mine do not spend millions of dollars lightly. We do this because it creates a better environment for everyone. It's more collaborative, it's more effective. We expect our employees to be able to work with colleagues all over the world and recruiters will start to expect new workforce members to be culturally confident. It's not gonna be a question anymore, it's going to be a requirement. It's evident from emails sent by some of the school board members that the school board staff itself needs diversity and inclusion training. And let me be clear, diversity training is not CRT. And I'm so tired of hearing that because critical race theory examines our legal system and institutional racism. Diversity and inclusion training helps us to learn about the lived experiences of others with the goal of celebrating our differences and supporting each other. The more I interact with other parents, the more I learn that most of us in my group fully support the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We've been quiet supporters for too long and we will not be silent anymore. I don't care who donated to your campaigns, I don't care who endorsed you, but when you took that oath and you sat down in that seat, you committed to support and to represent every student in every single building. If you continue to fail in this matter and if you continue to equate DEI to CRT, it's gonna become evident to the community that I represent that you are more interested in using the school board as a tool in your own political agendas than doing what's best for our students. Thank you. Mark Dixon. <coughs> Mark Dixon. Thank you. Members of the board, Dr. Lathan, esteemed cabinet members, gathered stakeholders, diversity awareness, intentional inclusion, and the equitable treatment of fellow human beings are not the enemies of academic achievement. In recent years, there has been a significant discussion, opinion formation, and mobilization around the premise that American schools are declining in their ability to teach our children because of attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I believe that this has become a movement which grossly overstates certain concerns and vilifies honest and well-intentioned attempts to make our schools well-rounded and effective institutions of learning in our society. Further, this thinking has created an imaginary either or battleground between diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within school systems and academic achievement, which of course is the desire of school districts, parents, and communities alike in our great country. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not mutually exclusive, nor even antagonistic approaches to the education of our children. We can do both, and we should do both. You see, good educators become even better educators as they come to understand, empathize with, 
and knowledgeably guide students towards success. Let us not become pawns of rhetoric. Red versus blue, me versus you. In an endless milieu of anti-civil name calling, box characterizations, and scary but poorly defined acronyms. If we are to really improve public education in our community, it will be because we have returned to the place of mutual respect civil dialogue, and an unswerving commitment to provide our children with every available tool for their success in a world that, like it or not, is very different from the one many of us grew up in. I hope that in the coming days we can take a step back, take a deep breath, allowing us opportunity to lay down our philosophical swords, really refocus on our children, and find a way forward <laughs> that doesn't leave so many of us wounded, publicly bleeding over our community. Thank you very much. The last speaker is Danny Lacio. Good evening, uh, Danny with the Glow Center again. I wanna start off with a quote. Darkness is only the absence of light, like loneliness is the reason we fight. And fear is the reason we might never know what it's like if we realize that the meaning of our lives and lived as if life depended on the gifts we try to hide. At school, we want our children to learn to free their minds and tell them they can grow up to be anything. Yet there is a war going on and the casualty is truth. Regardless of how you word it, the board is trying to make thoughts, representation, and opinions illegal. These children are counting on your empathy to be more powerful than your fear. They need to believe in a world where there's room enough for everyone to breathe, and we as individuals need to acknowledge that the reality of who had the privilege to decide what was right and wrong in the first place. We educators continue to tell you what we know, but you tune us out, so I will tell you what we do not know. We do not know how many folks we will lose to mental health, suicide, mass incarceration, mass extinction, to hate crime, domestic violence, to police brutality and toxicity. We do not know, but it's getting harder to breathe. So much so that we can look up various forms of strangulation. I can't breathe has moved the consciousness of the nation, but I wonder when it will move our feet. My son, a young, proud black child, couldn't wait to play football once he got to junior high, but it hasn't been the experience he was picturing. Boys love patting, touching each other's privates. Are white players referring to black player, players as inlets? I will not say the actual word. And say the white players are asking the black players to do things like tie their shoes, carry their belongings. This is currently happening in the schools. This is hate. This is ignorance. This is why representation and inclusive curriculum is so important. So regardless of how ugly this is, I do know that love is stronger than hate and truth is more enduring than any form of lie. If you are not willing to change, nothing will change. The most powerful tool in the hands of the oppressor is what's inside their heads and the most dangerous weapon lives inside their chest. I ask you each to hold a mirror to your heart and what does it reflect? What will be the message of your legacy? In a world where we can be anything, we must be more accepting. There is no academic success if there is no equality and accessibility. If all lives truly did matter, you would be embracing and listening to your diversity, equity, and inclusion department instead of stomping them into submission or trying to dismantle them altogether. We are past the point of saying we aren't racist, homophobic, or denied privilege. As I tell my children, actions speak louder than words. And the actions of some board members are examples of racism, homophobia, and why we need representation and inclusive curriculum. So do not ban what you do not know. Do not miss, dismiss what makes you uncomfortable. We must become comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. And the more uncomfortable the conversation, the more important it is to have it. So this is your opportunity. What legacy do you want to leave? I'm leaving you with information from GLSEN to go through and show that our schools are not safe for our queer students and recommendations on how to fix it. Thank you for your time. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is consent, <coughs> consent agenda items. These items were presented to the to us at the September 6th study session 
our review and we've had an opportunity to ask questions. The recommended action at this time is that the board approve consent agenda items 3.01 through 6.01. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any comments or questions before we vote? No? Let's vote. <coughs> Motion passes. Okay, we're moving on to the treasurer's report. Thank you, Dr. Mulford. All right, good evening, board. I have a list of questions I'm going to ask Dr. Mahomet Khani. <laughs> no, just joking. Um, uh, the good news is we've got money in the bank, which is always a good way to start the school year, right? So um, when you look at the treasurer's report, we are projecting that our fund balance will hold uh, pretty well steady as we go throughout the course of the year. So we uh, feel confident that we will end in that 25-26% range, which is where we hope to be. And as you all may recall, that is intentional, right? So a couple other things I want to point out to you. Uh, the annual external audit that all school districts in Missouri are required to have. Uh, ours will begin this next month in October with Westbrook and Company. And they will have the final report to the board by the December board meeting for your review and approval. And then one other thing I do want to point out, uh, as, you, as you look at the revenues versus expenditures, you will notice that we, this fiscal year, have spent far more than we brought in as, as revenue up to this point. That is typical at SPS because, as a reminder, about 60 to 65 percent of our revenue is local, and we don't get that revenue until property taxes are paid, so that's a December-January payment. All right, so you'll see that, and then you'll see a big uh, jump in revenue, spike in revenue the end of December, end of January. All things considered, very finances look very good. Economy continues to, to remain strong as far as funding goes, and state revenue also remains strong. Any questions? Okay. John, thank you. Recommended action is that the board approve the treasurer's report as presented. I make the motion for approval. Second. I'll second. Uh, thank you. Any comments or questions before we vote? Okay, let's vote. passes next on the agenda are informational items first the student achievement presentation update dr. Lathan is going to be providing us with information on the beginning of the year universal screener thank you good evening board members uh, dr. Holt and dr. majors will actually lead us through the presentation just to remind you uh, board members and also to our uh, public last March the board approved for us to enter into an agreement to purchase a universal screener that we will administer three times a year. We call the beginning of the year assessment. So tonight you'll receive the beginning of the year assessment. <coughs> the year is called a middle of the year assessment. And then in the spring, end of the year. Remember tonight establishes the baseline. I'm looking at where our students are at this moment in time. And then in the middle of the year, we'll look and see if we've been able to grow students or to provide the resources that students need. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Holden, Dr. Majors. And before you, colleagues, if you could just hold your questions to the very end of the presentation, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, board, for the opportunity to be with you tonight, as we promised. Uh, provided you academic update in the month of August to kind of forecast forward where we were headed for the year. You knew that having a universal screener that was uh, given to all students K-12 across the system was a part of our plan and a part of goals, and so we're here tonight, um, as promised, to give you an update of what that beginning of the year data is looking like, as well as remind you of our plan and next steps for future use of the data. So thanks for the opportunity. 
here is really our purpose for this evening. We will be giving you an update of the Universal Screener, which is Galileo, and we will share district level data with you tonight by grade, band, and by course. Um, as we get into high school, you know that looks a little different than the way we assess in elementary and middle, so we will give you both of those. We will not be sharing building level specific data tonight or the bystander breakdown of data, so we just want to make sure we're very clear with what we will be sharing and what we won't be sharing tonight. As a reminder, all the work that takes place in the academic side of the house is aligned, and so obviously we shared with you in August uh, a reminder of Dr. Lathan's goals, which you are very well aware of, but this work really lives in the results piece of that information. And then, of course, we shared with you all three in detail of the academic priorities, which assessment lives as a support tool for each of those three academic priorities that we've forecasted over the years. The agenda for this evening will look in this way. We will start by just clarifying formative and summative assessment. One of the goals this year is that we are getting very clear with the language we use and everyone's definition of that language. That would include assessment, and so we'll start with that. We will then move into Galileo, give you some background data about the assessment as well as how it is scored, which will look different than tools that we've utilized in the past. We will give you district-wide results, and we will give you just um, some information around what we will do next to support leaders and hold leaders accountable, as well as support teachers and hold teachers accountable. <clears throat> so we want to just begin with this quote. Everything that we do hinges on this statement. So we make decisions about what we will do to support students and teachers in data. So we will use those to drive our processes and help us to continuously improve. And that is what you'll see tonight. So we'll start with student assessment, which is really about giving you some definition around formative and summative. So the work that we're doing, again, we like to align it to research. And so when we use classroom ass assessment specifically to, to inform instruction, we see results. So it doubles the expected rate of learning for our kids. We are in a situation where we need to support students with accelerated learning in classrooms across our system. And so utilizing classroom level assessment data is the means to support that work. We have to know why we are assessing, why we need that information, and then what we intend to do with it. So we hope that after we leave tonight, you are able to answer those questions. We just want to orient you to language that we use in our system all the time. We recognize that there's a lot of edges speak that might come out at this podium, and so it's important to us that you understand and are speaking the same language that we're speaking across the system. So this is not intended to be simplified in a way that might not feel friendly, but we wanted to align it to something we thought that you might be able to grapple with. Um, so when you think about assessment, a balanced approach is really important that you understand why you're assessing and for what purpose. So when you think about formative assessment and you think about it from a sports mentality, formative is all the things that you're doing, the little bite-sized learning targets that happen like, a, like in a practice. So if I were at soccer practice, I would be, as a coach, I'd be teaching students the fundamentals. I'd be teaching them how to dribble, how to not kick with your foot, but with the laces. I'd be teaching them how to shoot to score. Very different. I am not a soccer player, <laughs> by the way. I could have used a much better basketball or football analogy, but we went with soccer. So um, there are lots of different skill sets that build in preparation for the game, right? So the summit of assessment is the putting together and the packaging of all those individual goals to get you game ready. So how do you uh, put all that together, set up the right conditions so that when I get to the field and game day, I am well prepared. So you can see where both of those assessments, both of the types, both formative, all the little skills, as well as the summative, provide us the, a, a balanced approach to data and understanding. So we wanted you to have those in your mind as we get to the part about data. So again, just digging a little deeper, formative assessment is really about guiding and rather than judging. So this is about how we make decisions that guide us based on what we receive back. The primary goal of the formative phase is to identify that discrepancy be between where we want them to be and where they are. That's about mastery of the standards because that's what we teach by grade level and course in education. So how are they doing, where are they at, and where do we want them to be? What's in that discrepancy? And then we provide specific information or feedback 
right, about how we can reduce that, how we can make that the, the, from desired state to where they are better, or how can we eliminate it completely so that they can show mastery towards standards. That's formative. Summative really gives us that big picture of overall achievement. That's a piece that we're all very familiar with, right? That's our map data, that's our EOC data, that's an overall achievement level at the end. And when we talk summative, it's really two pieces. So validity and reliability, again, which are terms that you're familiar with, but wanting to surface them again to help you provide context around what you'll see. Whether an assessment measures what it intends to measure and how reliable it is. How consistent does it measure the intended measure over time? So Dr. Majors is gonna dig in a little bit about Galileo. Again, context for what you're gonna see and some um, information about the specific new tool that we're using. Good evening, Board of Education. Thank you for allowing us to share. This is exciting for me, as you know, as Executive Director of Academics, I love data. So I'm happy to share the data today and, and especially thinking towards end of the year when we come back and we show an increase in student achievement because that is what's going to happen. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> okay, so here you'll see our Galileo District Success Plan. So our first goal was that all students K-12 will take a beginning of the year, that's what BOY stands for, a middle of the year and end of the year Galileo student benchmark. So we'll have that K-12 data. Our second goal is that district and site leaders will engage in district and site specific analysis three times a year. The purpose of that is to identify strengths, areas of opportunity, and how we're going to measure progress in between these windows. So our third goal is that site leaders and teachers will utilize the Galileo benchmark and also formative assessment data, which you just heard about, to engage in recurring cycles of collective inquiry. That is, when, we, when you hear us talk about PLCs, that's what we mean. Okay, so this is, you've, um, you've likely seen this before, this is our assessment window and purpose. So today we're sharing data from the beginning of the year screener. So students took the benchmark between August 29th and September 9th. The purpose was to get a baseline score. So tonight we're not sharing comparable data, we're scoring that baseline data. And then again, we'll take the screener, the middle of the year, end of the year as well. Okay, so um, Galileo is a comprehensive assessment system that provides benchmark assessments, formative assessments, it also forecasts state test performance, and it's a, it's a, um, excuse me, it's a robust reporting suit that provides data to teachers and leaders so that they can use that data to inform instruction. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about the two different types of data that you'll be seeing tonight. So you'll see raw data, which is simply how many questions did a student get correct on the assessment? Um, and that is specific to each grade level standard. You'll also see item response theory data. So item response theory is an approach to designing and scoring assessments. It enables educators to measure a student's ability, not just their performance. So item response theory is used by virtually every major educational test, including tests by college and career readiness assessments like the ACT, SAT, and math assessment. Okay, so the overall ability score is, um, Galileo refers to that as the developmental scale score, so when you hear us say DL score, that's what we'll be referring to. Um, it's similar to what a student might receive on the MAP assessment. So Galileo took the MAP blueprints and they utilize those to create the Galileo assessment, and that's how it forecasts um, state test performance. So it takes into account the number of days of instruction. So the data you'll see on the DL level is where we would expect students to be the first week of whatever grade level they're in. So um, the characteristics of the items, they take into account how difficult an item is, whether it discriminates against students with different abilities, and if the student is likely to get it right simply by guessing. So we're really able, instead of just having access to that raw data, we're able, we're able to see a student's ability level. So the moment you've been waiting for, um, we're gonna dig in just a little bit <coughs> to the beginning of the year Galileo results. So before we do that, we wanted to remind you of who this data represents. So we haven't shared current enrollment or demographic data with you. So we wanted to do that first before you start to see that inform related to how students scored. So just as an update, here is our current district enrollment data pre-K-12. Just to clarify, our pre-K students 
did not take the Galileo assessment. However, they are included in our enrollment data, so just wanted you to know that. So our current student count, which we know won't be final until the middle of October, but this is where we are at as of the end of last week. Okay, so 24,000, and this gives you an idea of where we are relative to if those students are full pay or free and redu reduced. So you can see those numbers. Additionally, a frame of reference for district demographic data, again, includes our pre-K students all the way up through our 12th graders. So you can see by demographic where our students, who our students are. And then just a few brief updates and reminders. So over almost close to 41,000 assessments were administered in the beginning of your benchmark win window, which is incredible. Shout out to leaders, shout out to teachers at all grade levels for diving in with us, for learning with us over the summer in preparation for what this was gonna look like, for having conversations with their students about the importance of the screener. We know all of that helped inform this process. So it's not, it wasn't the work of what we did, but what they did out in classrooms to make this happen, to give us really rich data to dissect. That does include a layer of a set of tests that were created and administered um, for specific courses that didn't that Desi doesn't necessarily have the standards built into Galileo for. So we want to be transparent about that as well. And again, Crystal has already mentioned, Dr. Lathan has already mentioned, this is baseline for us. So we don't have point of comparison because we, ha we don't have more than one in. This is the very first time we're doing it. So it's important to keep that in mind. It's our baseline for student mastery. And then the monitoring reports that we share will give raw data and will show us rigor aligned to what our students will have to do on state assessments. But more importantly, it helps us to better identify misconceptions, which our prior assessment tools did not give us that level of intensity with, related, with relationship to how we can intervene instructionally. Just a couple things to remember there. I also wanna note, Crystal already mentioned it, but this is a snapshot in time. So what you're gonna see with the data is based on the number of days that students would have, would have had of instruction. So not all standards that a student would be assessed on are represented in the beginning of your assessment because we wouldn't expect them to know that at the beginning of the year. So I think that's important to keep in mind as you see the data. And again, it will be a developmental level. So here is district ELA overall beginning of year assessment results. So it is broken down into similar categories that you would see on a state assessment. So what we see and know right now is that about 45% of our students scored in the band of proficient or advanced relative to ELA. You will see grade level breakdown in a moment, but we start high level with district data. So there are the numbers relative to ELA. That same data for ELA by student scoring proficient or advanced by demographic. <coughs> or subgroup, which is the use that the term that our state assessment utilizes. Here it is by status, the students scoring proficient and advanced related to their status, free, full, or reduced. We broke out the free and reduced here just for you to have a better picture of how those students performed. We'll do the exact same data set for math. So here's district math overall. About 38% or of our students scoring proficient or advanced there in math. Same data now by demographic. Students that were proficient and advanced by demographic in math. And status relative to math. So Dr. Majors will now take you through the grade, band, or course specific data. So these proficiency levels are based on IRT analysis again. So when you see the, per the percent proficient in advance, this is the percent of students who scored ex exactly where we would expect them to score in the first week of school for their grade level. So 39% of our kindergarten students scored proficient in advance. Very comparable to first grade and second grade at 41% and 40% proficient or advanced. So we're going to follow the same trend that Dr. Holt followed. We're going to do 
K2ELA, then we'll shift to K2Math. So K2Math data, again, is comparable. 34.8% of our kindergartners scored proficient or advanced, 35.1% of our first graders, and 35% of our second graders. Okay, so shifting on to um, 45 ELA data, 42.4% of third graders are right where we would expect them to be at the start of third grade, 43.8% of fourth graders, and 46.2% of fifth graders. So 3.5 math, historically, our math scores are lower than ELA across the state of Missouri. And so um, what you'll notice here is that 36.1% of third graders scored proficient or advanced, and it's similar across the fourth and fifth grade. We're excited to share math data in December, which we'll, we are seeing in, the data is trending up for proficiency in math when you compare this data to our math data. Okay, 6A ELA, sixth graders, 41.3% are right where we would expect them to be, 40.6 in seventh grade, and 50.6 that's 6 through 8 ELA data. 6 through 8 math data, again, 34.80% of 6th graders are where we would expect them to be, 40.8% of 7th grade, and 32.10% of 8th grade. 9 through 12 ELA, um, we have ELA standards from the state for 9 through 12th grade. So we were able to give a benchmark for all four grade levels. So 50.9% of our ninth grade students are where they need to be. 54 of 10th grade students, 52.4% of 11th grade students, and 50.1% of 12th grade students. So now we're going to get into course specific data. So in Algebra 1, 27.9% of our students scored proficient in advanced. In Algebra 2, 27.9, very the same. And in Geometry, 94.4% of our students are proficient or advanced at the beginning of the year. Okay, a lot of data. <laughs> Come back to it, I'm sure there'll be a couple questions. But I think it's important for you to have context around what we're doing about it, right? Because that's the, that's the question. You have the data, now you're going to take action. What's that look and sound like? So we'll start with leaders and then move to teachers. So instructional leadership and support of that is a priority around academic, uh, from the academic team. And so building really great systems and processes for analyzing the data was important to us. So all leaders and teams of teachers across our system with the support of district coaches, learning specialists, and a variety of other people are going to be leading teams through protocols to dig into this data by standard, by grade level, to identify the deficiencies. Dr. Majors in a moment is going to show you what that looks like on the teacher side, how that data is um, computable for them to actually break down. But we um, are traveling to sites, EDs are making rounds to sites to support this work, to make sure that mastery is happening by standard, by priority standard for our students and teachers. That also looks like adjusting our plans. When you have more information, you have a responsibility to change your plan with the data. So we have new data at the beginning of the year now, and our executive directors are having conversations with our leaders about how do we create bite-sized, measurable steps that get us from point A to point B. It's not these grandiose plans that we make percentages that we know that we're not actually going to meet. It is what are we going to do very next between this time and this time to show growth by standard for our students. So just to give you a capturing of what that looks like, you're like, that's great, Nicole. They're going out, they're having conversations. What's, what's the actual data? Well, from September 1 to September 23rd, which is what the end of last week when you know this posted in board docs, um, we had had 121 coaching conversations and site visits with leaders. 121 from September 1 to September 23rd. 55 of those were focused on school action plans and how we make plans at the site level to support our teachers and students with utilizing data. 47 of those focused on either building the instructional leadership capacity of the site leader or the site leadership teams or how we take this information and utilize it in professional learning communities. 
So the work is happening and we are excited about the conversations that we're having at, having at the site level that are really turning into changed practice in classrooms. We also are gonna be launching Data and Dessert, which will be happening three times this year and the very first one is happening next week for our site leaders as well as their coaching teams that help them analyze data. We'll be giving them the opportunity to come together, dig into the data now that we all have it. They'll be able to choose a breakout session that meets their need wherever they are with implementation and they'll be able to leave with next steps to support their campus with understanding data and using it to drive instruction. Okay, so next steps for teachers. So we wanted to share, this is of the reports that you're getting ready to see, this is the scoring breakdown. So this is percent proficient on standards assessed. So all teachers K-12, that's okay. All teachers K-12 who administered the Galileo benchmark will analyze the intervention alert report to identify which standards students already know and which standards students need more learning on. So I wanted to walk you through this report I know it helps me to see exactly what the teachers are going to have access to. So on the left, you'll see um, the grade level standard. And then in the next column where you see the number, the first two, the first column, the one, 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 two. So that column is the number of items on the test specific to that standard. The next column you see is the number of students who mastered that standard. And then the next column is the percentage of students in this teacher's classroom who mastered the standard based on this assessment. So each, each other column is student specific. So we have blocked out names because this is real live SBS data. So you can't see student names at the top. Dr. Holt will show you where. So then each one of these boxes is student name and you read this report down. That's so helpful as I was doing this. I'm like, I did, did not, could not figure yeah, out this table. You can't. I read it too. I get it. Yep. So, so standards, here. Here standards here. Standards here for below. that grade level. Mm -hmm. Student names, obviously we've left out across the top. And you read down to see by standard where the kid was relative to, where the student was relative to mastery. Makes so much more sense now. You can read <laughs> across to see within that standard how many of your students scored in which category. So down by student, across by class. So across, the teacher may use that to drive her tier one instruction. Um, so the number at the bottom in the, the, the final um, white row, 15, that's the number of students that that, the number of standards that that student mastered. So the first student mastered 15 of the standards. So the beauty of this report is by standard, I can see where gaps exist for my grade level, for my, for my class, or if I'm sitting next to Crystal and we both, both teach third grade, we can see across the grade in our school where are the gaps, the ones that have to be remedied soon, where are kids specifically. So by kid, I can say, oh gosh, you've only got a couple places where you're basic or below basic. I can intervene quickly with you, elevate your proficiency in those standards, and you're good to go. So it really allows for data specific intervention to happen by kid, which is what teachers have been wanting. It also allows teachers to celebrate the strengths that the students already have. They can say you are proficient in five standards. Okay. You haven't even been taught yet, but you've already got it, great job. Okay, so this is a second report. This is the standards mastery report, um, test monitoring report. So this report, um, similar setup. So the, the best thing about this report is a teacher can click on the number in the blue row and they can access the specific question that was asked when they're trying to determine why the student missed the question. So this is data that we have never had access to. So in iReady, we could not ever see the question and how it was asked by the student. So we didn't know if the student had a foundational issue or if it was just the way the question was worded. And this data will help teachers drive instruction. You could so this report reads differently, right? Now student name exists on the far column and you go across and it's by question. So if we were in the live data, you'd hover over the question and you could pull it up to see exactly how it was asked. And answered. And answered by each student. So this is helpful because in prior tools, we never knew how it was asked. So we made a lot of assumptions about where the misconception lived for students or groups of students. Awesome. Now we can see exactly how and in what way they're um, answering and ideally we can intervene for different kids depending on their misconception. So we don't have to guess anymore about what they were thinking. 
We saw this being used in several professional learning teams just in the last week. And the beauty of it is our teachers are, are so good that they not only wanted to see how it, this type of question might be asked in Galileo because they know the standard, but they were going to map item analysis and saying, okay, but how does that compare to how we know they're going to be asked that question on the state assessment? So we have that ability now to, to look at both measures and make determinations. A teacher can also pull up those questions by class, so they can pull up how every student answered the question in their class, and it may be a simple misconception that then that can be fixed when the teacher reteaches the content. So you've seen the report now, and you might be asking, when are we doing this? Well, we've shared with you the priorities of professional, professional learning communities. That is where these conversations are occurring. So across our campuses, as leaders and teacher teams meet together for professional learning teams, they are focused on these four questions every time they gather together. And obviously, the assessment shows them what do we expect students to learn, who's got it, who doesn't have it, and what now can we do to intervene. So that's where these things are occurring. Additionally, I think it's important for you to know that by standard now, we can draft and craft our instruction in the classroom. We can design our lessons and utilize our curriculum in a way that supports students. So asking our teachers to utilize data and plan accordingly is the way that we get traction on what's happening, which is the reason why we've prioritized both professional learning communities, the place where you analyze the assessment, and how you do that in your classroom, the pedagogy and the science of planning, putting those two things together to create great conditions for our kids. Okay, so in the past, so every year we have had a curriculum and development council. Previously they met in groups, in a K2 group and a 3-5 group three times a year. We've restructured this year knowing that we have the data that we have, and so grade level or content teams of teachers are meeting beginning, middle, and end of the year. So when we meet, if it's a group of kindergarten teachers, they're going to dig into the standard, make sure we have a full understanding of how it's assessed. Then they're going to look at our formative and summative assessments that are included in the curriculum. And then we're gonna align, put those right next to our curriculum to make sure that our curriculum is teaching the standards for mastery. So teachers will compare student learning then to tier one instruction. And then we will adjust curriculum and instructional strategies as needed based on what the data tells us. So we're also writing formative assessments. Dr. Holt shared with you the importance of formative assessment as a balanced assessment approach. We'll be writing formative assessments to monitor progress with those um, teams of teachers because we know they are the experts. They're teaching the content. So we're pulling them in right after each of those assessments. We know that a lot of this work and the meat of the, of the way that we take action occurs on campuses, but we also have a responsibility right at the district level to ensure that what's happening there is in alignment with what we're providing and supporting. So it's that balance of change and work in both areas. So again, this is where the landscape that we hopefully have taken you across this evening gave you some more uh, clarity around the common language for formative and summative. Talked about how Galileo uh, score, scores our kiddos and how we can really work to utilize that data to support instruction. We gave you some district level data and hopefully some next steps, but we couldn't leave you without reminding you. It is one thing to look at student names and data and scores on, on a computer. It's quite another when you are reminded that each one of those lines of data has a face. We are in the student <coughs> business. And the way that we do that is intervening really, really well and providing really sound instruction, utilizing the assessment to make sure that we are meeting needs of each one of those kids. So they are more than just the numbers on that page and we honor that as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I have some questions. I guess my first one is, what's happening in geometry class? And how do we get that translated over to other math classes? Yeah, so I thought you might ask that question. Yes. We wondered if you might ask. Yes. So 1,256 students took the geometry benchmark. So 1,027% of those students are in seventh through 10th grade. So any student before 10th grade who is taking geometry, they're taking it in advance. Because, te because technically, you don't take, if you're on schedule, you don't take geometry until 10. 
So we only have 200 of that data. 244 students are 11th and 12th graders. So that is probably an explanation for okay. mm -hmm. But, okay. however, we have this data. We will be looking into why the data looks like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. The geometry tests were super high. Can you re-explain that? I didn't get that. Great span. Yes. So um, if a student is on following the path, so right now a student can take geometry as early as seventh grade. So within that data is included seventh graders taking geometry. They're clearly advanced to be seventh graders taking geometry. That means they've taken the prerequisite. So they've taken algebra. They've taken the things prior. So some of these students may be scholar students because they're ahead of track of where they should be. Only 244 of that in, of that number of kids that took it, are actually taking it in the track that it was, like in the, nor in the normal. So the normal. What was that other number? Right, right. but just 44 out of about 12. Point out, the students were registered to take the assessment based on the course that they're in right, yeah. currently. Right. And so that's why you have between 7th graders and 12th graders uh, in this geometry. You're saying like 80-something percent of the ones that tested in geometry are on an advanced track. Correct. Plus. Yes. Got it are taking it earlier than a normal student would. Yeah. Right. What's the total number in the data set there? 1256. 1256, thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got yeah, yeah, I had a question on the same uh, slide, but go ahead. We can stay on that slide. I have other questions, but we can stay on that slide if you want. 27.9 are proficient in advanced in algebra. You know, algebra to me is the most important uh, math. Uh, you use it every day. And 27.9 are advanced in algebra too. I got to ask the question: How did they get from algebra one to algebra two if they're not, if they're below basic, or basic? So this is assessing again. This is where a student would be at the beginning of the year. Right. So we wouldn't expect that a student would know all of the standards at the beginning of the year. Right. Does that okay. make sense? Oh yeah, no, no, I get that. Only good school. But yeah, and it was from the, the previous so they, year. They, haven't, they virtually have had no instruction yet. Right. So. When we present middle of the year data, you'll be able to see more specific data that's comparable, and I think that will help you understand the difference. So it's hard right now because this is IRT. Yeah, this is right. This so one thing to remember data. about just how kids acquire math learning is it's far more linear, right? It's more black and white math is than like a reading or an ELA where we right. may be able to utilize some prior knowledge. If they've never seen anything relative to algebra, we would expect that to look that way just because of how those building blocks are built in math different than they are in reading. So that's one thing we know for certain. Um, but right. yeah, more to be explored right with all of the layers of this data. Okay. Um, what kind of feedback have you received from teachers? And I know you're going to tell me that they love it or something, So, which is fine. What's the biggest criticism, though, that you've heard about this test? Yeah. So I think I, I can give you my perspective from, from being out in the field. Um, now, granted, I recognize who I am, and when I walk into a PLT, I hope people don't change their responses or how they engage, but I recognize that that's a possibility. I also have five other EDs out here that can stand and speak to what they're seeing because they've been in it more than I have. But what I have seen is a, an appreciation of the specificity of data that they receive. So our teachers who are very, our teachers in general are very hungry to know how to, how and what to do next. And this gives them far more of that. One criticism is that at the beginning of the year, majority of the questions were asked one time. So when you saw that standard report, standards were listed down the left column, you noticed that the in for almost all was one, right? Because we would expect them to just have very limited knowledge of each standard for when they took it. So as we get to middle of the year, it will be interesting to see how that data looks different as the expectation for their knowledge grows and more questions by standard are asked. So that's a criticism. A teacher says they may, and we know that, we know that Galileo accounts for guessing, but it was one question and I may have gotten it right and I may, that would have pushed me then to proficient or advanced. So that is one criticism that I've heard from teachers. I think the other, I, mean, I wouldn't call it a criticism, but it was just the shift to, that all the grades were tested this year. So right. uh, sure. grades that had never participated in the beginning of the year assessment, like our kindergarten uh, students and uh, teachers. So it was different for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they did a great job. And you add the other assessments that, that were required by the state also to be completed. So 
it was a busy time, but uh, like I say, our teachers and our principals, they did an exceptional job of getting the information, getting the assessments completed. Would you say that um, one of the criticisms, which is always a criticism, is the time that t testing takes away from instruction that yes. may have been a, a challenge for teachers, particularly in the grade levels that don't typically have those beginning of the year assessments. <clears throat> so having to take class time from instruction to do this, but I know that it has dividends on the other end, mm -hmm. but it does take uh, away from class time. Yeah, yes, we, we have heard that and we recognize, I think they knew it was a necessary evil, quote unquote. Um, and it was interesting as we were sitting in some, and again, I could have the EDs come up and share more with you, um, but a, a teacher saying, I, it was hard to do all of this, right, as I was building community in my classroom and trying to get that up, but here I am now sitting in the fifth week of school and I've already got groups set up and I already know exactly where my kids are and I can start right now instructing and, and knowing with more specificity what to do. So I, I, I felt this way, but now I see kind of is, is what we've heard. And it's a shift because we were using iReady, which did not provide us with the, uh, the formative information about where to go next. And so uh, this is a shift. So those who have not had the opportunity to use a universal uh, screener before may not have known what it could provide until after exactly. the fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To go through it, yes. Seems pretty cool. I have questions. Okay. Or, or questions and comments. One of the questions I have is for the early, one of the early slides that you provided, the demographic data um, on uh, lunch status districts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we get a breakdown of free and reduced? Because when you looked at the data later, there was a difference between free and reduced, and so seeing that difference would be helpful. Mm -hmm. We put it this way because that's how the state data groups it. But yes, we had that breaking out. Like we can send that to you. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, just for the benefit of all of us here in this room and listening otherwise, uh, can we? Can you also briefly just mention, particularly with regards to instruction, the um, the role that the summer slide plays with regards to student learning at the beginning, taking these assessments, the formative assessments at the beginning of the year, um, and how that may contribute to these initial formative assessments not being, uh, having the opportunity for growth, particularly at that, at that very first few weeks of, of this semester. And, uh, right, so we'll, we will have much more, we will be able to speak with much more uh, ability about that at this point next year. But I think we recognize and we hope, right, that Explore helps us, continues to help us with that. But just knowing that this assessment, assessing them on what they should know, right, at the beginning of the year and that time bound piece is going to hope, we hope is going to show more consistency from end of year to beginning of year. But recognizing again that this is only one assessment. So I, I can't stress enough that that's why it's still important for our teachers to be triangulating to other measures. Um, and, and we would say that regardless, right? Um, so that we say, and we've already had some teachers say, it shows this for these couple of standards, but as I've engaged with Crystal over the last four weeks, I, I'm not confident that that one question really gave me solid information on where she is. So that triangul triangulization will be con continue to be really important. You have more questions? I have another one. No, no, go ahead. So the other question that I wanted to ask was, um, I lost it. Um, I lost it. It'll come back. It'll come back. It's down at the bottom of the page. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you should sure ask a question real quick just to clarify okay. something before. I've got more, but just to clarify, because I feel like maybe I'm not tracking here, but I feel like I've heard this expressed two different ways. I just want to clarify. Are we testing what they should know now or what they should know at the end of the year? Again, we're testing the standards. So, but standards but these, that they should know by the end of the year. That's the standards they should know by the end of their grade level. Well, the standards they should know within their grade level, right? But this Which you wouldn't expect them to know until the end of the year. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. But we also recognize that there might be, I mean, obviously there is, we've seen some of the data, that they know some of those things coming in, right? Yeah, so these are, so we're testing on the things that they're supposed to be learning in that the rest window of, this of time. Year. Mm -hmm. For the rest of the year. Okay. 
So are, are the, the stand, I, I think that's the right word, the standards that are tested right now are the same standards that are gonna be tested at the same Across level the at the beginning, or at the middle and then at the end of the year? However, can we also discuss how those standards are timed over? So, you know, like if we have a standard for comprehension, by the end of the year, they should know these things, but there's objectives in the middle that get you there, and that's the kind of the formative pieces right. that tell you what steps they need to get in order to get to the final one, which is the summative assessment, mm -hmm. right? Is that kind of what it is? So like, for example, I, I'm familiar with the Dibbles. I'm not familiar with Galileo. And on Dibbles, it gives you information about the five parts of reading that are necessary to help you to be able to read. And so it's gonna give you individual data of what they should know in order to be where they should be at the beginning of the semester. Right? And so that's the formative information. The summative is to be how their overall reading is, not necessarily all those individual little parts of reading that are going to help them. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah, and not every, so to your point, not every standard was assessed at BOI. Okay. Right, so there's a slew of standards across that grade level, and not every single one of them was assessed at the beginning of the year. Because there might have been, to Sharita's point, steps within the standard that would have been built because of instruction from the current from the time at BOI to MOI. So you might see a standard that comes on at MOI that wasn't there at BOI. But by the end of the year, every standard they should have mastered will be on that final assessment. Okay, so the, the all the bar graphs that we were looking at, and I get that right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I remember missing uh, a question about a Venn diagram and like middle school You're I'm good. terrified okay. I'm going to get my diagrams wrong. Yep. Um, so you're talking the, these or the ones by grade level? Yeah. Yeah, the one that went by, the, sure, any of those are the ones that went by grade level. So that's showing 20.2% are below basic on the things that they should know really by the end of the year. And we're, so what we're trying to work towards is getting that number down by the end of year. Okay. Does any of the data show um, where, how they tested relative to how we would expect them to test now? So rather than comparing to the end of the year, the test they took, what shows you, it, it's okay right now, we haven't taught this yet. This is, this is how they're doing compared to what they should know now, not what they should know later. So that's what this data is. So our assessment last year was iReady, it was adaptive. So the, the biggest difference I think will help you, I mean it helped me understand it, so I think it will help you. So with, our, with an adaptive screener, if I am a fifth grader and I begin to take the test and I am not getting any questions right, it will adapt it down to a fourth grade sure. level. So that data that we get, the student may never have even been tested on grade level standards. So the big difference between our previous screener and this screener is that students are tested on grade level standards. So for this data, this data that you're looking at right here is based on where we would expect a student to be at the beginning of the year. So on the middle of the year screener, we would expect them to be further along because they will have had more days of instruction. And so when they do the IRT analysis. Well, you just said it, this, so I feel like that conflicts with what we said earlier. You just said that this data shows where we expect them to be at the beginning of the year. That's right. Yes, yeah, so they are tested on grade level standards. That's different. Previously, they were dropped down, but when they do the IRT analysis, they take into consideration the number, days of, the number of days of instruction based on where we would expect them to be now. That standard specific data is basically telling us where they would be at the end of the year. That's just raw data. Did they master the standard? Which was that intervention report, all of the red, green, the boxes? Yes. So Does that make sense? The standards don't change. The standards are the standards. Maybe it would help to show the DESE standards, like, because they have the standard and then the objectives underneath them. That might be helpful to see that. So I, I understand that the standards don't change. I would just expect to see from the data basically two sets of results. One that says this is how far they are along on those standards that we will come back to at the end of the year. And this is the data that shows where we really expect them to be based on where they are today. And I'm only seeing one set of data, or, or maybe I'm missing it. This is the second. So this data, it's just student-specific data. So it's by standard where we would expect a student to be on that. Right, but th th this is confusing. So the, okay. the, 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 the bar graphs where we're talking about, let's say by grade level, mm -hmm. yes. 
showing us data by grade level. Are you showing? Again, I feel like maybe I'm the only one not getting it. Okay, so the bar graphs that you're showing on by grade level, okay, yes. for math, does that show us where we expect them to be today, or does that show us how much they understand about the standards that they really aren't expected to know until spring? It's both of those things. So it's where, I mean, it is. It's, it's I would expect two things. sets of data, though. It's where no, it's they should be relative to how much instruction they've had on those standards, but it's also, because the standards are the same, where they are, like, it's the, all the standard. The standard is that this part is what they should have mastery toward, like, where we would expect, again, that, we're using that too mostly, what we'd expect them to know relative to that specific standard but we also know that at middle of the year, we're going to be able to see, because more, more has happened, where they should be. We don't have any uh, SPS comparative data to say, for this bar, what, what it should look like. Because this is the first time we've well, We don't know how to assessment. compare it to ourselves, but I would think uh, that Galileo has that data to know what some sort of expectations, correct? Of but this is the first time we're in the system, so you got to think about like making your open your your first yeah. bank account. You yes. make your first deposit. Well, Galileo it's doesn't have a the, the, they don't have a, a sort of like a, a data standard of where you would expect a not fifth a, grader to be a in test. September a on that. Test. And, and it's hard. To, I mean, it's the, it's the first these are great questions. <laughs> these are great questions. But remember, this is the beginning of this process. It will be clear in January when we present the middle of the year and th some of those questions that you're asking, you'll be able to see that. But remember, we're at the very beginning. They don't, ha they don't even have a record of us. This is our I'm first not, record. I know, but I'm not record. asking for comparative data against us. I'm just saying there's got to be standards that we would uh, expect. Maybe I'm using the wrong word, standards. But there's got to be a, a, a benchmark. data benchmark yeah. that we would expect an average fifth grader to be at at the beginning of the year of fifth grade, right? So I'm looking, so I'm thinking, where's that line on there, you know? So but I'm not, I'm not, I think we're speaking two different languages. We are. So, we, so we really maybe, are. maybe this question will help. So that one right there, algebra one, 27 point, okay, 48.8% um, below basic. What would you hope that number to look like? What would you project that number to look like if we've done our job by spring? Is that number going to shrink? Is that number going to stay the same? Of course, we would hope, right, that we would be moving kids between categories, right? So obviously, our goal is proficiency. And proficiency by student is this. So that proficient students have mastered 60 to 79% of the standards for their grade level. So we're moving towards those targets of proficient or advanced. This scoring breakdown, though, is only by student. You can't extrapolate these numbers into district roll-up data. It doesn't work that way in how that as this assessment is scored. So that this, bar graph you just showed before, mm -hmm. we're tracking forward like we hope to. That'll start to do this. Yep, so for, we would hope that at middle of the year, 48.8, go those kids would move either into basic, right, or if we're if there was minimal misconceptions here, things that could be remedied quickly, then we perhaps could see some of those kids move to proficient. But I think what's important is this roll-up data is fine, but it's this data that is more important, that we can track and see the by-student movement, which is based on these breakdowns, these expectations. So by middle of the year, we'll be able to show you fifth graders on the standards, like we want every student to be on grade level. That's always the mark we're trying to hit. So we'll be able to show you how all fifth graders scored at the beginning of the year by standard compared to how they scored in the middle of the year. So do you set goal? That's the data that you're looking for. I will stop my line of questioning because I'm just further confusing things. And if, if Scott or Miriam have questions along the same line, maybe it's a good time uh, to yeah, switch. Yeah, are you setting goals Dang. for the middle of the year? Correct. So hmm. that, uh, that protocol. What is that? What are those goals? It's, it's by grade level, by, by grade. building. By, so it's, and we're not seeing the building. All we're seeing is yes. the district. You well, just and, overall. And really, right. right, that data is owned there, and that's where we want it to be owned. We want them individually looking at this report, having conversations with Got their it. grade level colleagues, and setting realistic, reasonable goals based on how, the, how their curriculum is paced, what their student needs are, what makes the most sense, how that's tested on the map. I mean, there's... 
So that level of specificity occurs at the site level, which is where we need it to occur because they, they are the ones that are taking action. So when Dr. Holt shared next steps for leaders and she referenced that data protocol, within that data protocol that for the first time ever we were able to roll out a data protocol K-12 because we have K-12 data, within um, that protocol, that first picture there, that's where they set grade level goals based on looking at the data. So if we could, uh, these are great questions. I'd like for Matt to come up and talk about the plans for uh, date and dessert to leading principals through that process and their coaches uh, next week when we have that. I know Matt's here also, uh, just to kind of talk about it. Because that, like I said, it's gonna get to the heart of, like you said, the buildings are owning the data for the next steps and those additional reports. Remember, our goal is to provide a high level, but we are going to be drilling it down to the building level. And we will start talking about uh, buildings and where they are uh, as we move into the middle of the year and the end of the year. So this is Matt Rosebro. He works in the curriculum department. He helps with curriculum, intervention, and assessment. So he is the brain behind a lot of the data that we're gonna roll out for leaders at this data and dessert. So do you wanna share what that data looks like, Matt? Sure. <clears throat> so if you kind of go back to thinking by standard, so our buildings, when we pull in the map data, we get our map data in the buckets of performance level that you saw with the below basic, basic, push and advance. That doesn't tell a teacher what to do with their instruction to change it. So we are drilling down to an item analysis summary <clears throat> and we can drill down clear to the class level. So within my third grade class, if I'm a third grade teacher, I may be working on this set of standards because my class needs this set of standards, but the third grade across the hall may have a different set but we also may have where we can rely on each other. So what we have pulled data-wise from Galileo that you haven't seen because we've taken that way down is that when we pull the data, we can pull it by class, by building, by grade level. And so we have a data protocol that they're going to then use. They're gonna look at two points of data. We want third through fifth grade to look at their map data by standard. And they'll be able to look at their Galileo data also by standard. So they can see if there's discrepancies, and if there's a huge discrepancy, we're going to need to look then at the question types. And so we can look at that. We can look at the depth of knowledge of the question. The state also has given us item specifications for each standard. So they've told us what the expectation is of how they will ask the question. And so we can form our own formative assessments within Galileo to reassess after we've retaught. So at that point, the teacher can focus on a certain standard, reteach if needed, whole group or small group, and then they can give that assessment, reassess, and then in Galileo, they can give a formative that they can then use that data then to guide their instruction, and they're either gonna move on or reteach again. And that's just a process that continues to happen until hopefully we get those kids into proficient advanced levels. But it's just gonna be a slow trickle of, we move them slowly from below basic into basic, and hopefully from basic into proficient, but it's based on the focus of each grade level standard. Yes, great. Oh, you, oh, I forgot, she has a, she's whispering. Her question is, teachers can use Galileo on their own. Yes, they sure can. They can create their own formative assessments based on the needs of the students that they have in their classroom. And we will be going deeper into that at the teacher level at our Activate SPS November. Uh, we'll have a 95 minute session at Activate a Professional Learning of, here's my Galileo da data, now what can I do to progress monitor throughout the year. So we can use Galileo to progress monitor, but I do K-5 literacy, so we also have reading assessments that we can do to progress monitor as well, so that we have more than just one da data point, because we want the kids to be successful in multiple data points to really show mastery. So, okay, so this question I'm about to ask is uh, focused on district-wide approach, not on individual students and what the teachers can do with students. I'm talking data as a district, okay? Does Galileo work with other Missouri school districts? Yes. And have they prior to this year? Yes. So do they have data on Missouri school districts? So we've actually met with another school district several times to discuss the data. They haven't shared their data because it's confidential. But Galileo works with other districts, so they would have 
not, I'm not talking specific student data, but Galileo could look at one district and see their bar graph and look at another one and see theirs. You want, you, you want normative data. You, you, want, you want normative data. That's what I'm, I'm asking This is for, not a normative test, though. That's what you, you're wanting normative data. I'm asked, that was the point of my question, is if we're testing them what they should know now versus what they should know later, I, w I would expect to see in those bar graphs two sets of data, one where they are, one where we think they should be. But that's not what kind of test this is. Exactly. This is a, that's why she started with the discussion about mm -hmm. formative versus summative assessment, because that's not what kind of test this is. You're wanting the test to do something that it, it's not. It's they're testing them to the state standards, correct? Yes, but they're looking for formative information about where the students are with regards to what skills they need in order to get to those state standards. So we do have the data that you're talking about, but it's by grade level. That's so what I was asking for. Yes, so we don't have district-wide data because it's a grade level assessment. Yes. So like when we got to high school, we had to break it down by course for because in math, we don't, we don't have grade level standards in math. We have course specific standards. So this is only a grade level assessment. So we will not have district-wide specific standards. So grade data. level. We do have that by grade level. So grade level. If I'm looking at these charts and I see that the, the, um, there you go. The, in algebra, there you go. Sixth grade. I'm looking at below basic for sixth to eighth grade math, and I'm looking at that number of 35 percent, and I'm thinking. Let's hear Dan talk some more, Mr. Brewer, about math, right? I'm looking at that saying. What does that mean? Like, where should we be? Should we be really concerned and focusing here on math for sixth to eighth graders, or is that where we expect them to be because they haven't been taught that yet? So in December, you'll get to see statewide data and our math data, and that will provide some clarification about. From last year, our students were last spring on math tests, correct? Yeah, correct. End of year. Yes, on end of year. Yes. But you aren't willing, as a group, to draw any conclusions from this about more generally how our grades are doing. No, no. So it's not that we're not willing. I want to make sure we're very clear on that because when you say not willing, that means like people refuse. That's not the purpose of this assessment and the way we presented this data. This is a starting place for us to look and see where students are the second, third week of school that they were assessed. Yes, we're trying to get to the finish line, but I also, I think we're missing the point. Go back to the slide where we have the, um, the teacher report, please, the student report. The intervention report, please. Those, the point we're also missing here is those students that are already ready, already on grade level, already have mastered these pieces, how are we also moving those students? So that's, the, that's a piece that's missing. But we're not going to, we're not going to uh, say something that's, that, that's to provide the wrong information or overcommit mm -hmm. something that this product does not do. And that's not what we went into an agreement to purchase based on the information. And as it relates to comparisons to other school districts, this is not the, the, the comparison to other school districts. You use the MAP data and the EOC data across the state. You don't use this data to compare to another school district in Missouri or Florida or wherever. This is about our own internal district data. So I want to make sure we're very careful. Instructional and it's a lot. I only ask whether the school districts to have an expectation of where, where the mean should be. That's all I have. That's the only reason. I'm not saying compare us to other districts. I'm saying is there data for us to understand where the mean should be? No. There's not. I mean, and so, and like I said, we just can't create something that does not exist. But it does predict. It does predict. We, and right. And that was at the very beginning. And it but predicts I, based on their ability to meet those little points on the side, that yes. ones on that side. If they're able to meet those, it predicts their ability to meet the overall standards toward the end of this, the grade level that we expect for the state standards. If you look at the DESE uh, uh, standards, you can kind of see how those are mapped out and how there's a big one and there's an objectives below. And if you do these, it'll help you meet that one. That's what this does. It's helping teachers and instructors. I know how the standards work. My question was separate to that, but thank you. But you keep asking the same question that is overriding what you're saying you understand. Hold on. I think I know, I think I know what the confusion is because I was similarly confused. Can you hear me? Yes. When you did the elementary and middle school or elementary, you said, this is where we expect the kids to be. But then when you did algebra, you said, oh, this looks this way because they haven't received it yet, this is going to look better. But you presented it differently, and I think that caused confusion for me, and I don't know if that's... Yes. I'm understanding it a little bit more. 
Do you see what I mean? So like when you did <coughs> third grade, you said, this is exactly what we expect them to be. So for me, I'm like, ooh, that's, we have, you know, we gotta get that curve changed a little. Yes. But then when you did algebra one and algebra two, you said it differently. You said, oh, the reason this looks this bad or the way it does, because they haven't received this instruction yet. You didn't use the same words that you used for elementary, which is where we expect them to be. And I think that's, and I got confused. I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, so this so, is where we expect them to be at this time in the year. So which, we're, which was we're okay for elementary. For the proficient and advanced students is what I said. Oh. So for the proficient and advanced students, they're scoring right where we would expect them to okay, be got at it. the beginning of the year. Does that make sense? So that statement, that, that helped. helped. That, was, that, that just only applies cinched to proficient it. And advanced. Okay. The that others, we're going to move them. Right? Cinched it. So for algebra one, is that the same statement? That's where you ex the proficient advance is where you expect them to be. Right where we would expect them to be at the beginning. Okay, so that number really is not good. So it's it, it, <coughs> it needs to same. move. It needs to move. We always want those numbers to be Well I know, but it's just the way you said it. It was all, not that you're making an excuse for algebra, but you presented it differently and that caused confusion for me. It, I'm a little less confused because of the proficient in advanced. Did that clear up anything for you? Did that help you, Kelly? Um, that was a little... Better than when it started. Okay. We're making advancements. Yeah. Does anybody else have see any if my See if my curve turns into Most a Those of us who don't here. have education, or are not educators by trade, I think, at least myself, I'm, yes, I had trouble grasping it. Whereas everybody else seems to be, yeah. To yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Gonna, I'm sure. Part of the discussion is no one should. We're not expecting you to be an expert at this point. Yeah. Uh, right. The first time around, second time, third time, but we will get through it. The the purpose of tonight was to start the discussion around student achievement, and if we if we all agree, that's why we are here. And like I said, that last slide about the faces. We also, I, I just want to make sure staff understand and you know we are, I appreciate them. I'm speaking for Granita Latham, mm -hmm. superintendent. I appreciate the efforts that have been put into <coughs> getting us for where we are today. Uh, thankful uh, to our principals and our teachers and everyone that has truly just bought into understanding that we do need to use data to drive instruction and to make informed decisions. So thank you all uh, for your efforts. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I, I would. <laughs> If I may, please. I, I want to echo that. Um, I was really impressed earlier, uh, a couple board meetings ago, when you came out and talked about how you're looking to uh, measure and how you're going to hold people accountable. And I think this this formative way uh, assessments and in order helps you do that. And actually, you can find out where your instructors are with the students themselves. Uh, the, the, the bottom line here to me is I really am uh, uh, pleased with what I hear and what I see. Uh, I think the, the real test is going to be the middle of the year and the end of the year. And I'm just hoping that we can uh, have that benchmark with DESE and th these scores to find out are we really performing better in comparison to other school districts and that and at the grade level that we need to um, one other aspect of that is is you know if you start getting somebody a student that begins to excel quite rapidly um, that we're prepared in order to help them advance uh, it is an important issue to me it's just like mr. Burrow was talking about how he has his grandson and he took him aside and he was able to take him from grade one to grade two to grade three uh, and so I'm hoping that this doesn't hold a student back and then we do have uh, we we do have in consideration and I think you would because I think they've done very well uh, that we are going to help them advance beyond their grade level and not hold them back Correct. yeah and that's a that is a piece that this data provides us that prior hasn't, right? So that we can see right now 
Do I, and now, again, I want to remind you, <clears throat> a question, right? So we have a responsibility, right, to continue to assess those kiddos that did score advanced on that question to continue to be giving them those formative benchmarks to make sure that they hold that mastery of standard. But if they show that over time, we need to be extending and providing additional opportunities. And this gives us a starting point to do that. And, and the executive uh, team, too, going out and ensuring that we're, we're accountable to that. Uh, and so I think that's marvelous. I really think you're doing a good job. And I want to say thank you very much, all of you. I, I want to say the same thing, just thank you, but also I want, I want the board to know that I appreciate the difficulty with the language, which is why you started with the language, um, because this is a, a completely shift in paradigm of how we've looked at assessment data in this district, and I understand that we are used to looking at data in a certain way, and assessments in a certain way, and this isn't it. And so it is a big shift in paradigm, and so I appreciate the confusion. And we feel it here, right? And our appreciate teachers feel it. I appreciate the fact that there is confusion. I appreciate the fact that there is confusion. That's going to be a meme. Somebody's going to make a meme out of it. <laughs> Scott, do you have any questions? Oh, no. I'm good. I just said one more question. question. Work on this. Only because this, I think this is the first time we were seeing this. Did, did you say that uh, the, the early on, the uh, free and reduced numbers, is that the first time we were seeing that this year? Yeah, that's the first, it's the first time we've shared. Data. They're still in draft format. I mean, they're not, not finalized fine. in the middle of October, but it was, I thought and it was we wanted to know it's, we been, it's been a couple of years since we've done that, correct? No, we do that every year. We have to do enrollment data. Do we still, I thought, well, during COVID, there's funds for that, so I we thought. We still had a percentage oh, okay. of students that, um, so what, back to, uh, what you, I think you're referring to people completing the actual applications. <clears throat> okay. So, but we still uh, had a free or reduced lunch percentage. It just fell back to the previous year. That last year, 2019, uh, we were utilizing that percentage of the last time that we actually formally uh, had uh, the requirement of people to fill out the applications. Did, that, since those numbers, I guess, are in or about in, um, how did they compare to prior year, just generally speaking? Right. Uh, prior years were about the same, a little bit higher if we can get those, we have about 600 more, more applications. More free and reduced. More free and reduced lunch, yes. So the numbers are up just slightly, but if, like I said, we have a, about 600 students, the number might have gone down since we met on Monday, that we still, they're kind of in, what is that status temporary, called? Temporary uh, status, uh, that we still need their form so that then they will qualify for either free or reduced lunch because they qualified previously, but their parents have not submitted the forms. And so we're, um, out conducting home visits and trying to get those last few forms in. Thank you. So the numbers this year will be accurate? Yes, yes, the, yes, the numbers are based on the applications that are in thus far. Uh, so those are the numbers that you're seeing on the um, screen. Danielle, do you have any more questions? I do not have any more questions. Thank you so much. And I just want to make sure you reiterate that all these questions well, is questions. for us to just understand the like, important, critical work that you do and, and just well, it's not in any way critique of the process. We're all learning together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Next on the list is strategic plan update. We all received an update on our agenda for this evening. Does anybody have any questions? The strategic plan update. Okay. I know, but this is the first time I've been through. I do have some questions. This is on the strategic plan update. Oh uh, yes. Right. We, there's nobody here to answer from the. Uh, we're here. I'm here. You know, <laughs> from the consultant. <laughs> <laughs> See, I words know. matter. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. the so only up. Remember, we have a um, we have a schedule of, <laughs> of when the consultants will be here. Remember, right, what well, we made a commitment though to provide you updates at board right. meetings, so those right. updates could be written or they could actually be a formal presentation. Right. Thank you. Okay, so tonight is a written right. Thank format. You. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so I have one question. Now. Is this what we're expecting? Is this within the expectations of what we would get from the responses that they've seen in the past from other districts? Actually, and actually we've had a little bit more participation based on what they shared with us last week. Like some school districts didn't even choose to do face-to-face -face meetings. They strictly relied on their surveys. Uh, and so it's just been a combination. So it kind of varies from school district to school district as far as participation. Okay. Uh, but, and so that's, that is consistent. And they will share that information when they present to you uh, in November. Okay. 
Next on the agenda is the check into orders and agreement for the bond project updates and actions. Dr. Shaw is going to provide us the update. Good evening. Uh, I have a relatively short list for you this evening. Uh, all of these, which are made up from Field, Plain, and Jarrett projects. Uh, just one agreement in the list, and the list totals $78,504.39 for your consideration this evening. Any questions on any of the items I can clarify? The recommended action is that the board approve the change orders and agreements as presented. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Danielle Scott. <coughs> Steve. Oh, Steve. Oh, Steve. 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 Danielle Steve. Steve. Are there any comments or questions at this point? <coughs> okay, then let's vote. Motion passes. Next on the agenda, superintendent's update. Yes, uh, last night we welcomed our second group of 20 SPS ambassadors. This is a collaboration with the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools. So we have 20 new ambassadors that started their first class last night. Um, just as a little background for the board, we provide an overview of the district. We provide tours out to our different facilities. So last night they had the opportunity to uh, tour the GSC. Uh, facility and also the new Boyd Elementary School. Uh, I provided an update, Dr. Range and also Mr. Hall provided an update and overview of the district. And so they'll meet throughout the course of this next school year. So very thank, uh, special thank you to the foundation for supporting us. On Monday, we kicked off Pay It Forward, which is, which is our United Way campaign and also our foundation for Springfield Public Schools. Our goal this year is to raise $50,000 and the great thing about it is we raise the money, it goes to the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools or the United Way of the Ozark, but the money comes directly back to our students and to our district. Uh, it is flu season, uh, so our health services department is working to schedule flea, uh, free flu shots for staff and students. Just want to remind everyone about our new tool this year, our communication tool, uh, tool called Let's Talk. Board members, I have some cards for you. Please feel free to give these out to your constituents and people you meet that have all types of questions. If they want to send a question, our response time is about 24 hours so that we try to get back to uh, parents or uh, community members that have a question. I've held three Gather with Granita events this year just to uh, connect with our staff to hear what's on their mind, for them to ask me questions, and for them to get to know me better. So those will continue throughout the course of the school year. And we are working on a de definitely um, recruiting uh, for paraprofessionals, custodians, and uh, nutrition services workers. Uh, that's where we are hard hit. Notice I did not mention another group that we talked a lot about last school year. We still need a few more drivers, but right now the priority is around paraprofessionals, um, nutrition service workers, substitutes, so, and custodians. So if you can help us out, please let us know. That concludes my uh, updates. Um, next, we have board comments, so we're ready to hear reports and comments from board members, and so that we don't forget, I know the three I like this side for that community task force, do you have any of you want to give us a report? <coughs> a report? I am truly encouraged on the results of the community task force at this point. Uh, even more so because we have people from the community that's stepping up and participating in something that to us is very important in that we're looking to improve our facilities, renovation, those type of things where um, they are meaningful. Uh, you know, I think that we're to a point where we are now uh, prioritizing facilities. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if I go astray here, but it's important that we assess those facilities and we line them up and we're in we'll have a presentation that will be coming to the board uh, for us to consider and there are some other things with regards to the community task force that are very important and that is the levy uh, how much money are we going to spend uh, I mean certainly there's a lot of people that would like to spend every penny that we have you know and uh, and that really uh, depends on us it's it's going to come down to us folks uh, 
to determine on just what facilities we deem to be a priority after their input is given. Uh, but I, I really feel uh, confident in what we've done up to this point, all of our discussions. Uh, a lot of great questions are coming out. Uh, and we're getting a lot of uh, other community involvement, too, that want to say so in this process and everything. And so I, I'm encouraged with it at this point. But that about accurately put it. Yeah, I was going to go into a couple more details, but go ahead. Do you have anything else? No, I just, you add to it, my good man. Uh -huh. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I want to compliment David Hall and Richard Dirks. They've done Absolutely. a great job yeah. uh, leading this once again. I mean, uh, really, they got everything down, and, and it's... Uh, everything's pretty smooth, very smooth. And I uh, also want to compliment Travis Shaw, who's up there every every meeting, giving good presentations. And uh, we're learning a lot from you. Thanks for all the time and input Amen. Uh, that you put into it. You know, and uh, you know, we have heard let's, from... Uh, let's not leave out Dr. Mulford and Shannon. Uh, right, I mean, she's, she's really banging out the communications and that. And Dr. Mulford's over there just, oh, he's trying to, I know you got us breakfast. Yeah. Not only that, you're she trying to put yeah, PowerPoint yeah, presentations yeah. together and I understand right. that's yeah. not your forte necessarily, right. but. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you do, <laughs> Shade. He's been taking a lot of digs on that. And he? Uh, <laughs> yeah, presentations are not uh, his forte. <laughs> sorry, it's gotta go. I was gonna mention them, but not the PowerPoint. No, <laughs> But also, uh, we heard from Travis, but we also heard from uh, um, Dr. Brent Blevins, the managing director at Stifle. I think we're going to bring him in later to <coughs> talk about the, the bonding and the different scenarios we have for bonding. So uh, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's complicated. So, it is complicated. Uh, we're going to hear hopefully more from him uh, in the future. And then Matt Morrow came and, and talked about the economy uh, in Springfield economy in particular and how it compares to the national or state trends as well and it's actually a pretty good economy right now compared to other places uh, and then as, as um, Steve mentioned we at the last meeting they started a voting system they have that down they have an app that they use and they vote and we just stand to the side the board members are not in that the high school students are in there there's a 19 people who showed up last time are, are doing that voting and then there's great discussion afterwards okay why did you vote no why did you vote yes and there's just just good uh, uh, healthy discussion going on there, and uh, really, <coughs> and as like Steve said, we hope to present it to the board. It looks like um, October fifteenth is it? Mm -hmm. October uh, to sent to the board for review by October seventh and presentation at the October eleventh board as well as um, okay. study session coming soon. Yeah. Coming Thanks. your way. Yep. <laughs> so it's I'm encouraged by. It. I have nothing to add. Any other board comments? So our <clears throat> upcoming meetings, there's the community task force meeting that's going to be on Tuesday, October 4th at 5 o'clock, and our next study session coming up in two weeks, October 11th. Just want to remind everybody about our plus, de <clears throat> plus delta items. If you have any, please write them down on the sticky note and give them to, <coughs> to the board secretary at the end of the meeting. And then as for executive session, there will not be an executive session meeting this evening as we had originally scheduled. And so therefore we're going to do a roll call um, to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion that we adjourn this meeting. Mm -hmm. Second. Just second. Kelly. Even Kelly. Gosh, you guys want to stick around? No. <laughs> Steve. I'm, I'm doing a roll call, starting with you. Aye. <laughs> you had to think about it? Well, I'm like, roll call, okay. I was waiting for it to come up. What's going on tonight? I made the motion. Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>